This week's episode of the Ortho Show podcast is brought to you by BioBrace from ConMed Corporation. Introducing BioBrace from ConMed Corporation, the revolutionary reinforced implant designed to strengthen your repair and optimize your healing. BioBrace is a game changer. Unlike traditional implants that are either synthetic or biologic, BioBrace is a unique biocomposite of both. Ready when you need it and easy to use in a variety of techniques, BioBrace has multiple sizes for a variety of soft tissue indications. With its proprietary architecture, BioBrace is durable enough to support suturing and cannula passing. It features a highly porous type 1 collagen matrix reinforced with bioreabsorbable PLLA microfilaments. Through augmentation, achieve native tendon strength within 12 weeks. Strengthen your repair, optimize your healing, choose BioBrace from ConMed Corporation, and this is exactly why I use the BioBrace for my patients routinely. All right, another great episode. We're all over the place at the Ortho Show. We talk to, to the iconic leaders in sports medicine. We talk to doctors from all over the world. We talk to people that are new in their career, and that's exactly what we're doing. Dr. Mith Mamaya, who's an orthopedic surgeon, specializes in sports medicine down at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. He's only six years into practice, but this dude is crushing it. He has an amazing social media campaign. He does it all on his own. You can tell he uses personalized videos. He's attracting patients to his practice. He's part of societies and journals as far as editorial boards. Industry is, is seeking him out as well to be involved in their studies because of the work he's, he's doing. He provides great counsel and advice and a really new career path for up and coming orthopedic surgeons on a way in which you can share your story and message and your brand with your patients. I really appreciated this episode. He's coming. He's going to be doing a lot of great things. Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro. From Medical Media, this is The Author Show. Hello world, Dr. Scott Sigmund, your favorite opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon here for another episode of the Ortho Show podcast, where everyone knows we bring you the best of the best in orthopedics. We are going south. We're down to Alabama, Birmingham area. We are bringing one of the rising stars in sports medicine. That's Amit Mamaya, who's an orthopedic surgeon, specializes in sports medicine. He's an associate professor of orthopedic surgery at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, where he is the head team physician. What a pleasure it is to have you on the show, brother. Thank you, Scott. I've been listening to your podcast for a while now. You, you have some great content out there, and I appreciate being on the show. Yeah, man, we got we we're doing all kinds of things these days. We got CEOs, we got industry, we got amazing orthopedic surgeons like yourself. So we're just thrilled to be able to share uh, some really remarkable stories. So you know, it's interesting. I looked your name up for the record, and I'm not sure if you you know this, but your name means boundless in Hindi, and it's also an e, a Hebrew name, which also uh, uh, means friend. So you've got a lot of good history there, and I think your parents thought hard about uh, naming you when you came in. What do you think? Yeah, no, uh, I guess I got to rise to the potential of that name. I got big shoes to fill for that name. Yeah, 100%. I think there's a lot of truth to that sometimes, you know, for sure. So look, at the start of the show, we always start at the beginning. So I, I'm going to joke around with you a little bit. But how old were you when your parents told you you were going to be a doctor? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's so common, uh, especially among Indian ancestry, kind of to put a large emphasis on education and helping people. Those are kind of two core values for my family. And so you know, I think they had dreams, you know, they sacrificed everything when they immigrated to the United States. And uh, they had dreams of me getting educated and becoming a doctor and serving kind of the communities and helping people. So from an early age, um, you know, I, I definitely had that in my mind. Were you born here in the States? I was. I was born in Chicago. Fantastic. Did you spend most of your childhood in Chicago as well? Or? No, you know, we moved early, early on to uh, kind of the suburbs of Atlanta, northeast Atlanta. And so I've actually kind of most of my formative years were in Atlanta, Georgia. Fantastic. All right. So Atlanta, Georgia. You've got it. You know, we, we've heard this story. We have uh, so many doctors on the Ortho Show of Indian descent, and we joke around, of, of course, about that. But you know, doctors, engineers. You have uh, education's paramount. Family is paramount. You know, make a difference on the planet, especially for for immigrant parents. So that's a great story. It's a common story that we hear. So apparently, you did pretty well because you got into Duke, which is no easy feat for undergraduates. So was it early on that you were like, this is something? You know. 
medicine and orthopedic surgery and sports medicine, or was that a process? Yeah, I think it was somewhat of a process. You know, I enjoyed science and math growing up. Uh, biomedical engineering was something that I gravitated towards just from a uh, the developments that were happening in the field. It was growing exponentially. And so, you know, when I decided to go to Duke, there was a, they had a great biomedical engineering program. I grew up playing baseball, running long distance. Um, I continued to run at Duke long distance. And so I think the sports medicine aspect of things kind of married well with the actual science and math aspects of things. And orthopedics was kind of a perfect marriage for me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the biomechanical engineering phase of things, I think, is a perfect sort of segue into a medical career, especially within orthopedics with all the tools and things that we do. But was it like at Duke, you're like, I'm going to buy, I'm going to be an undergrad, you know, major in biomechanical engineering and I'm going to medical school? Or was that still not really, you weren't sure yet? Yeah, I, I think in the back of my mind, I, I had that plan going in and uh, then the plan that I ended up following. But uh, the great thing about, you know, biomedical engineering is it, it, you know, leaves the door open for multiple avenues. And I have friends that went on to do consulting for McKinsey or Bain. I had other friends that went to law school. I had other friends that went on to <clears throat> finance uh, jobs. But that biomedical engineering foundation really sets you up for an analytical mind and process thinking. And so I think that's that was the great thing about it. It's so versatile. Perfect. So you do well, obviously. And then you're off to Baylor uh, in Texas for your, your medical degree. Um, so you're in medical school at this point. And again, I mean, are you still thinking, you know, orthopedics or you're looking or you're open to all ideas at this point, trying to figure out your path? Yeah, I, th I think going to medical school, you know, early on, I started shadowing orthopedic surgeons, um, getting getting in the operating room and shadowing. And I absolutely loved it. Orthopedic surgery is just, as you know, is so different from even any other surgical specialty. A lot of people would say you got to figure out if you're going into medicine or going into surgery. And for me, it was either I'm going into orthopedic surgery or something else. That's how different uh, the field is for me. And so I absolutely loved it. Got involved with a little bit of research there. Um, and uh, I, was, I was very determined to go into orthopedics. All right. So then, so, you know, Alabama for residency, you're, you've decided you're in, you're going to do this thing. So tell us about your residency and you know, give out some shout outs to your mentors and the people that were really making a difference for you. Sure, sure thing. You know, um, residency, uh, it can always be kind of a, a, a tough and daunting process going through the match. Like I couples match with my wife, who's a pediatrician. So that was always kind of up in the air, kind of where we're going to end up, because, of course, both of us wanted to go to the same place. <clears throat> and the UAB is uh, one of the busiest trauma centers in the U.S., kind of the third busiest when I was going through. And um, it was busy. It, it was busy. We uh, we pushed 80 hours work weeks all the time. Um, but I enjoyed it. You know, Orthopedics is repetition. I got a lot of repetition. There was no shortage of that. So it was great to be able to um, go through that process. You know, one of my mentors in residency was Brent Ponce. He's a shoulder surgeon. Uh, he's a great guy. And um, he's one of my the guys that recruited me to UAB for residency and actually brought me back later for a job, helped bring me back. But um, <clears throat> he kind of took me under his wing, kind of helped train me within the sports medicine side of things with shoulder and knee stuff. Um, so that was a great experience. Also got to spend some time with Jimmy Andrews and the sports group there, kind of learning how to take care of high level athletes in Birmingham. And so that was a great experience. Um, and then I, of course, decided to pursue sports medicine and specialize in that. Yeah. So you stuck around down South. You weren't going to head back up. Uh, you got, you, you got that Chicago winters early in life. You decided you're going to stay down South. So you, so you're off exactly. to Stephen Hawkins of the Carolinas for your, for your fellowship. Now, Hawk was probably not practicing at that point, or was he? he I was actually his last fellow. You know, we were we were That's still awesome. doing clinics, and uh, Hawk's a great mentor of mine. I mean, he's just a wealth of knowledge. Such a humble guy, right? He he he's very honest about outcomes, very honest about his opinions. Um, so it was great to be a fellow under him. Um, you know, the one of the most important things he always taught me was there's nothing more humbling than long term outcomes, right? And he was a very data driven guy. He said we got to we got to follow the research and kind of follow evidence-based medicine. So that helped a lot in terms of kind of training me that way. And then JT Tokish was also there who helped recruit me to Simon Hawkins. And he's just a terrific guy, just a great uh, educator and mentor really cares about his fellows. So I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that fellowship year. Uh, I definitely helped, you know, sharpen my skills technically, but what I really got even more out of it was actually the mentorship from my 
from the surgeons that were there and just the kind of the fellowship among the co-fellows. Uh, just we, we text almost every day, whether it's difficult cases or it's about off the wall topics and it, it's just that fellowship can't be recreated. Yeah, no, esprit de corps. We, I do that too. You know, it's difficult. Even now, 27 years in the practice, there's still something that will walk in my door that I've actually never actually seen exactly before. So when you have a consensus, you've got a texting group, you know, your buds that you hang out with, you grab all of their experience, and then it just really helps to, to be able to develop consensus on those difficult cases. So I love that. But all right, so, so you do this amazing fellowship, but let's be honest. I mean, a, a lot of people do sports medicine fellowships, and the vast majority of people are doing it for one of two reasons. Like, maybe it's filling a gap that they didn't have in their residency that they wanted to do so, or maybe it's to give them some specialization within their practice that they're going to. But it's not easy to get an academic sports medicine, you know, faculty position. So that was were the stars aligned? I mean, how did it work out that you could just jump right into the job? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> coming out of fellowship, I didn't, I didn't know if, if I was going to head back to Birmingham, kind of kept my options of, uh, open. Uh, as I mentioned, Tokish and Hawk really opened up a lot of doors and got me interviews at a lot of, a lot of very prestigious places around the U.S., which was nice. But ultimately, uh, we loved Birmingham, Alabama. It's such a great mid-sized city. Uh, we could see ourselves settling down there. Um, and so we decided to come back. You know, again, my, one of my former mentors, Brent Ponce, and my chair, Steve Tice, uh, kind of brought me back to really – grow the sports medicine program. And um, we, we were kind of in silos here at UAB prior to that. Didn't really have a large comprehensive program. And so I had the opportunity to jump on that and really kind of grow that. And um, I could have walked into a practice that was already, you know, flourishing and just been kind of another cog in the wheel. But I think that ability to get into, get into a practice and grow and envision what you want to do with it is, is really a cool, cool process, to be honest. And kind of, you know, like yourself, you're an entrepreneur, right? Like sometimes it's just the process of seeing something go from your idea in your head to growing it out there. That's just a cool thing to see. And so that's kind of what I've experienced in Birmingham. Yeah, no, I mean, again, I mean, it's really unique to be able to jump in, to be able to get this type of a faculty position. So, dude, you've been in practice for like six years, right? And the classic, you know, way in which you build a practice is you hang up a shingle, you wait for patients to come and see you. You try to shake hands and then you make it into societies and maybe somebody from industry calls you one day, but you're one of the new breed. You, you've taken this, you know, bull by the horns approach where you're like, I'm not waiting for anybody. Uh, and and for the people that know us, know me well, I'm writing a book with, with Matthew Ray Scott on Physician Brand Rx. And so you really captured my, my, uh, um, my uh, attention because of the way in which you're so out front and out and to the front there. So where did you learn this? I mean, did, did somebody teach this to you or did it just sort of come naturally? You want to express what's happening in your orthopedic life? Sure. You know, <clears throat> I'll be honest. I think it was, uh, it was uh, different facets of it um, came about for different reasons. I think one thing is Birmingham is a, you know, every market saturated, but Birmingham is a pretty saturated market when it comes to sports medicine. Uh, you come into Birmingham and you want to practice sports medicine, you're going to be doing a lot of general orthopedics. Um, and that's fine if you enjoy general orthopedics. I, I feel like my skill set was best suited to do a lot of arthroscopic knee and shoulder surgery. And so I think part of that compelled me to get my voice out there and offer patients uh, newer technology, innovations to let them know what I'm doing differently. And so part of that helped grow my social media presence. But then as I did that, I through that process, I also realized that I learn a lot from others, um, whether it's LinkedIn or other avenues um, where I'm seeing what other orthopedic surgeons are doing, some of the cool techniques and innovations they're doing, because we don't always get the time to step away from our practice and go scrub in, you know, with someone, one of our friends in another city or anything. But uh, technology has allowed us to kind of step into the operating room for see glimpses of what they do and learn from that. So largely it's been a process of, kind of teaching myself as I go, building that brand. Um, but then other things have come up about from it, you know, linking with other physicians, linking with industry, those kind of things have just naturally come about because I'm doing that. I think that's that's exactly, you know, correct. And I think it's fascinating that you're self-taught uh, and that's sort of the new generation. Of, of course, 
you know, you're, I think you're like a Gen Z. Are you a Gen Z? I think you're a Gen Z. I, I was, you know, I was making fun of the resident the other day for being a millennial, but then uh, I was born in 85. And so they said, actually, you're a millennial also. Yeah, you are a millennial. Uh, yeah, I'm embarrassed. You're, you're knee deep in millennials. So, but that, that, you know, you grew up with a cell phone in your hand, a smartphone and all those things. So it, it's really intuitive for you. But what you do is, you, you know, you develop personalized videos and you do a lot of things. You're educating patience and one of one of my favorite sayings is you know allowing your ideal patient to find you right so when you open the door to see your next patient they already kind of know who you are because they've been following you they've googled you they you've had great reviews and and so by messaging in, in the way in which you have you've accelerated your career growth to the point where you're you're really developing a mature practice very early yeah i, t I totally agree and it, it has jump started my practice and uh, and and I can attribute a lot of that to kind of some of the stuff that we do through technology. You know, we, we had uh, Ivan Tornos on, CEO of, of Zimmer, and uh, he'll be on in about two weeks. And one of the things that I really loved, which is what he said, is that, you know, we need to part, so industry needs to partner with surgeons, right? You got to be able to have the ideas and concepts. And what what he really said, which is very appropriate for you as well, is like, you, you don't have to be an old guy with gray hair. You know, if you've got really good opinions and you're early in your clinical practice, we want to hear from you. And so what you've done is, you know, you're getting calls from industry now to be able to get on a podium and share your biobrace technique for your quad ACL or for your allograft ACL. So they found you because of the work that you were doing behind the scenes to share your story. Again, really cool. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, and it's a nice marriage between linking uh, kind of younger minds, quote, um, to industry and you know I, I think having a diverse group of ideas of seeing how people with a lot of experience do it but also seeing how kind of a newer generation is uh, approaching uh the same kind of problems yeah you know and when the premise in our book is you know you can't you, you can't be too old to try and get into this either right because i can tell you if you didn't practice for 15 years you're in alabama birmingham then you know the the dr Mabai is right riding driving right by you man those patients are going to go see him so you better get off your chair and figure out a way to do personalized videos and do things to be able to share your message but uh all right so look you know let's talk about a few other things that i think you and i you know share in common which the vast majority of orthopedic surgeons are hesitant uh, to take on risk. They're hesitant to, you know, try new concepts and ideas. They, my favorite line is, show me the randomized controlled trial, right? I mean, by the time something has a randomized controlled trial in sports medicine, we're probably already moving on to something else. And so how is it, wh where, where was it in your training or within your background that has given you the, the courage to innovate and try new concepts and ideas very early on in practice? Yeah, so some of it certainly comes from just kind of the centers I've been in are centers where you see new products and uh, innovative products kind of hit hit the market and surgeons trying it, right? So a little bit of that, that mentorship and having the comfort to try out new products, that's one. Number two is, I agree, you know, by the time you get a randomized controlled trial, I mean, the product's been out for years and years and we, even with the randomized controlled trials sometimes out there, we know the fragility index there is not great. Um, and so who knows, it could go one way or the other. So I think having a little bit of belief in the basic science behind some of these products and putting them in your practice and then following your patients and seeing how they do is important. Um, and so that's kind of where my growth and comfort has been with <clears throat> using innovation. You know, of course, like like yourself, I get several new products thrown at me all the time, right? And it's not like we're biting every single one because that'd be just way too much to handle and wrap around. And most of them are probably not as innovative as we think they are. Um, but there's certain ones that come along that are quite innovative. And uh, we start off kind of slow and uh, see how our patients do, see how it handles, talk to other surgeons how it's going. And then we build studies off that initial experience. Um, so I think that's kind of what my growth and experience has been, is been an early adopter. <clears throat> Always have some skepticism in your mind, but be an early adopter and watch it develop and contribute to that development, right? Um, that's kind of how I've approached it. And then share the message, right? I mean, to the, to our young listeners out there, or even the people that have been practiced for quite some time that maybe have concerns about trying new ideas and concepts, Evidence-based medicine is really important. It, it, it's paramount for us to be able to prove the things that we're doing that truly work. But you have to believe in experience-based medicine too. So 
jumping on board, trying something new, getting some patients to see how they do, but then follow your colleagues that you also believe in that you know, for example, are using this product. What are they saying? Are they seeing similar results? And that communication, you know, with experience-based medicine, I think really, really makes a difference. And so I already know the answer to this question. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you anyway, uh, because it's really apparent. It's always comes across. It's very easy for anybody that follows people on social media, but you basically write your own material, you produce your own material, and you share your own material. You don't pay someone to do this for you. It's, I mean, I know the answer because it's so obviously apparent that, that you do that, but just share that with us. Yeah, no, I, I think it is a time investment, but I, I do enjoy the process of educating and communicating out myself. And, you know, do people do it different ways? Um, but I think when the message comes from you um, yourself, the, the the tone and the approach is a little bit more genuine. Um, and, and I think readers and other surgeons in industry can pick up on that, um, on that material. And so some of this is done between cases. Some of this is done at the breakfast table at 5 a.m. in the morning while I eat my bowl of cereal. You know, it's it, where surgeons are busy, right? We're working several hours a week. Uh, we have other obligations, whether it's family or, you know, other hobbies we do. So it's difficult to kind of just set aside time and do that. But um, between our busy schedules, I think we can find time kind of on the go. And you'll know, start noticing what downtimes are best to do this kind of stuff and what works for your flow and so forth. But yeah, um, you're right. I, the majority of the content and everything that's the videos and the social media and so forth um, are kind of just learning on the go, right? And how to do it. And um, I, I think as genuine as you can be. And I think the patients appreciate that. I think in this day and age, to be honest with you, the ROI on developing a brand and your social media brand and doing it on your own so that it really is actually you know, the truth about who you are, I'd make an argument just as important as getting reps in the operating room or, or reviewing the literature for the latest things that are happening. It is an incredible worthwhile investment that helps to, to grow your practice, that helps to get you communicated within your colleagues across a larger network and allows your patients to know who you are. So they want to come and see you. There's nothing better than a patient that says, I drove 30 miles to go by 30 orthopedic surgeons to come and see you, Dr. Moy, because I saw you on the internet and you're doing a great job. Yeah, and, and that's just the current current state is our patients are becoming more and more savvy also. Uh, they they want to look up ahead of time in terms of you know how your ratings are, what kind of surgeries do you do? And, and it really matches the right patient with the right surgeon, right? Because they've kind of they've already screened you in a way. They want to come to you. Uh, versus before we had uh, dissemination of information easily over the internet, you may have the wrong patient come to the wrong surgeon, you may have a patient show up and it's like, well, I don't actually even do that surgery or we're not the right fit or, you know, X, Y, Z. So I think that does help to just kind of streamline things. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, I, you know, I'm a, I, I joke around, you know, I practice in a small village just north of Boston. I'm in private practice, but yet, you know, I'm able to operate on a patient from Kuwait today because she wanted her Barry CL done and I knew somebody, a physician there. So that's how it develops. That's the relationships that you have uh, as you're developing. So, you know, look, there's a lot of cool stuff that's happening. What What's getting you excited right now? with some of the new technology, or, or at least some maybe the new procedures, things that are really getting you excited and the results may be unique is what you're seeing as far as the outcomes. Yeah, you know, I <clears throat> kind of piggyback off what you said. I think uh, first call, uh, kind of establishing the umbrella of the bovine collagen. I think the bovine collagen is a separate industry that's kind of come into orthopedics and, and a lot of different products are out there with bovine collagen and it's allowed us to, help tissue heal in a more reliable or efficient manner and get thicker tissue. And so one of the examples, like you mentioned, is Bear. One of the other examples uh, that both of us, I know, have used BioBrace. Um, <clears throat> you know, what we're noticing is we're doing studies where for the BioBrace, for example, we're participating in the randomized control trial uh, for rotator cuff repairs, right? We still have an unsatisfactory healing rate for larger rotator cuff tears. And so that's somewhere you can actually make a difference. And I think the BioBrace anecdotally we've seen good results so far and we're participating in the randomized control trial so that's one number two though the the bear right i've i've had a lot you know birmingham's an old school town i've had a lot of surgeons uh other healthcare professionals say no way you can't repair the acl the acl cannot be repaired or should not be repaired i 
I, I think I get a, I, the patients tell me this, the patients come to me and said, well, I saw so-and-so a reputable person and they think they're, you know, you're crazy for trying to repair an ACL. And I was like, well, no, no, I was actually, I was part of the, I was the medical monitor for MIOC orthopedics uh, when they first started these randomized control trials. So I follow the data very closely. If there's anyone who knows the data, I mean, I was in the mix of it. I, I review all the assessments. I review um, all the adverse events. I mean, I am following this data very closely as part of my agreement with the company. And the bottom line is, is first of all, it works. Uh, clinically, it works. Patient report outcomes, they're out there. Number two is also you got to deter, you got to compare it to the standard, right? Taking an autograph from a patient, there there's morbidity with it. I realize we've done it for years and it works, but there's significant morbidity, right? You can't tell me taking a patellar tendon or a quad tendon or a hamstring tendon from someone doesn't leave residual deficits for life, honestly, for life for most people. And so I think that's one of the neat things is kind of uh, kind of tipping the scales towards allowing someone to preserve their ACL without the morbidity of harvesting something. Scott, I hope I hope in 20 years that only 10 to 20% of ACLs out there are autograph reconstructions. Yeah, I, I, I completely, you know, you're right. I mean, that, but that's the way we, they're, they're going to look back at us and say, what's going on? What, what were these guys doing back then? But, yeah. you know, I think God is good. The, you know, the body has an amazing ability to heal itself. And and I, I've said, re, you know, previously, we used to be mechanics, but now you have to be a biologic mechanic. You have to, you know, fix the problem, but can you help to get the body to help heal itself? I, you know, just so you know, I'm actually going to be on the BioBrace rotator cuff uh, clinical trial as well. And uh, I'm formally uh, making sure that you're going to write the paper and I'll just sort of make sure it goes well. <laughs> no, I'm just, just kidding. We'll be more than happy to contribute, but I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you on that project. We're, we're just about ready to get started. But, uh, you know, those are the technologies and things that are available and keeping an open mind to new concepts and ideas. Otherwise, you know, we're going to be doing the same thing. Like I, I used to do partial meniscectomy and acromioplasty when I, when I was your age, you know, and those are operations we just try not to do anymore. So, you know, it's amazing that the, the innovation in space that's happening. Look, brother, this has been fantastic. You know, we're coming, we're coming to a close. Uh, you know, we have a lot of young orthopedic uh, future leaders out there that are listening and, and are, are part of our process. What would you give some give some advice for them in their early careers at this point about trying to how you can really help separate yourself from the rest of the people in the crowd? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, I think keep an open mind. Right. So I think uh, young surgeons need to keep an open mind, not be dogmatic. Um, I think they need to follow follow the evidence, of course. Um, but be open to newer technology because a lot of times you, we get busy in our practice. We say, all right, this is the way I was taught in fellowship. This is the way I've taught in residency. It's easy to get, just follow that lane and just kind of keep doing the operation that way. Um, but things get a little stagnant. I, it says that we can do, we can do better. I always think we can do better. And so as you try new things, um, you know, that's what I'd say is to separate yourself, keep an open mind and provide innovative technology to the patients in your community um, by following the evidence. And then number two, uh, like we discussed already here is, um, you got to figure out how to brand yourself. Um, you got to figure out how you're going to communicate to the audience you want to communicate to. Um, because the, the age where we can just kind of sit back and wait for the patients to come to us is closing quickly. Um, or, or your practice is going to be rather slow. Um, so I would encourage, you know, the newer orthopedic surgeons coming out there, to really engage with their community, um, whether it's go give, go give local talks, whether it's be active on social media, uh, whether it's lecture to the local residency, um, there's lots of opportunities and not everyone's gonna do the same exact thing, but that's the great part about it is people can pick and choose what they wanna do to kind of communicate with their community and let them know what they offer that's different from the 10 other orthopedic surgeons down the street. Oh, that's absolutely great advice. And for our listeners out there, you know, identify, you know, some some young doctors that you seem to really gravitate towards, follow them, look at their ideas and concepts, engage with them. Next thing you know, you're part of the community and you're learning cool new stuff and ideas. And then your patients are knocking on the door to come and find you. So really great advice. Look, this was fantastic. Love your energy. Love the fact that you are, you know, so involved in, in so many aspects of, of orthopedic care at this point. You're doing an amazing job. Looking forward to working with you on the BioBrace Rotator Cuff study. That's going to be fantastic. Really, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to share your remarkable story with our listeners. Well, I appreciate it, Scott. Uh, keep doing the awesome podcast. Love listening to you.
All right. Fantastic. This is Dr. Scott Sigmund. Hashtag follow the fro host of the ortho show till next time.